So good evening, my colleagues, and I do hope everyone is doing well. With the last time we met, uh, we looked at this table right here, right? About the uh, property classes and the definition. And uh, here's the uh, depreciation method, right? And we talked about for tax purposes that we would use makers. Modified accelerated cost recovery system. Right, so we would use makers for that. Okay, so here is the uh, rounded depreciation percentage uh, by recovery year, right? Using makers, and you can see the recovery year. So for th for the three year depreciation, which was like up here, you see that. You would do 33%, 45%, and 15, and then 7. And then you'd be fully depreciated, right? You'll notice that you're depreciating most of it up front, right? For seven years, it's more spread out. You notice how it's more spread out? And for 10 years, it's more spread out to depreciation percentages. So, um, but anyway, these are the percentages you use each year to uh, depreciate, uh, you know, items you have, depending on what, uh, you know, class we have them in here, right? Okay, and there's a thing called a half-year percentage, right? There's a half-year convention, and this assumes that, on average, firms acquire assets in the middle of the year. So you basically... Uh, so I want to show you something rather interesting. You'll notice it says three years uh, makers, but you notice there's four years because they're assuming you're doing it in the middle of the uh, first year, right? In the middle. So you'll notice five years has got six, really. Look, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on and so on. Because that assumption, as I said here, the half-year convention assumes that on average firms acquire assets in the middle of the year. So the allowable de depreciation deduction in the first year is smaller than it would be if firms would take a full year's worth of depreciation in the year they purchase an asset. But as I said recently, I don't know what the current depreciation schedule now is. Maybe, maybe you're allowed uh, to do it up front now full. Um, I, I, I really uh, don't know. Uh, So because firms can take only a half year's worth of depreciation in the first year, they can take an extra half year in the year after the usual life. So you can see why there's um, an extra year. So to illustrate, observe that in Table 4.2, an asset falling in the three-year recovery class is depreciated over four years, which is what we looked at, right? So you saw that, right? And so on and so on. So here's a really nice example that uh, we should go through. And this is example 4.3. So Baker Corporation acquired for an installed cost of $40,000, right? That's installed. You notice that. A machine having a recovery period of five years. Using the applicable percentage from Table 4.2, calculate the depreciation in each year. And you can see how they just simply multiply it each year here. Right, 20%, 32%. And when you finally, by the end of the, uh, or middle of the sixth year, you're fully depreciated, right? So you're 100% depreciated. I don't know, let's see if this lets me highlight it. Yes, it does. Okay, so, so that's how that works. All right, so now uh, that we've known that and we've uh, gone through depreciation, which is interesting, uh, we're going to develop a, a statement of cash flows now. Okay. And we all know what a statement of cash flows is from Chapter 3, right? We've, we've seen that. And th again, this will summarize the firm's cash flow over a given period. And cash is king, as they say, right? So um, we're going we're gonna to be uh, looking at um, cash, and they call it a reservoir, right? The reservoir is increased by cash inflows and decreased by cash outflows.
So as you remember, in chapter 3, there was three sections of the uh, statement of cash flows, okay? And uh, we kind of like talked about those. There was operating cash flows, investment cash flows, and financing uh, activity cash flows. All right, so these kind of come from, you know, debt and equity financing transactions that uh, you do as a company. Operating is the money coming in directly from your sale of your products. And investment activities is uh, cash flows associated with the uh, sale and purchase of uh, your, some of your assets and whatever equity investments you have in other firms, okay? So so don't forget that uh, you, know, you can invest in other companies, right? You can do that. And uh, and financing is uh, debt and equity financing, like when you issue an IPO or do a bond issue. All right. So okay. So we're gonna like classify inflows and outflows of cash. Uh, this is very important uh, concept here. All right. So. Let's go through this. When, uh, when a firm earns positive net income, for example, that counts as a cash inflow. That should be very obvious, right? That should be pretty obvious to everybody. That's a cash inflow, right? And let's look at some other stuff. Perhaps less intuitively, when a firm's income statement shows a deduction for depreciation expense, that too is a cash inflow, right? That's because it's a non-cash charge, and it basically you, you're going to put that back on your income statement, right? And pay less taxes, right? Depreciation expense is an accounting entry designed to smooth out the reported cost of an asset over time. Similarly, changes... And accounts on a firm's balance sheet reflect inflows and outflows of cash. In general, increases in assets, right, on the balance sheets are associated with cash outflows. Now, that should make sense to everybody, right? Because you have to spend cash to buy assets, such that when you have a house, you buy assets, you spend cash, right? If we see that a firm reports higher fixed assets from one year to the next, that means cash outflows is tied to the acquisition of those new assets, okay? So we got to understand what inflows and outflows are, right? So if inventory or receivable balances are lower this year, the firm generated cash, right? It came in by selling inventories or collecting accounts receivable. So that's a positive. Is everyone clear that that's a positive? All right. And there's a lot of negative. So let's look at this table here, shall we? So inflows. Here's the table, and we draw a line right down the middle here, right? I'll draw a line right down the middle. And inflows, are if you decrease in your asset, that means you sold it, so you bring in cash. If you have an increase in, li in any liability, Right? That means uh, you held on to your cash and you didn't pay your bills. Obviously, net profit after taxes on the bottom, the bottom of the income statement is an inflow, if it's positive, right? So depreciation, we said, and other non-cash charges are a positive. All right. So that's a positive. And if you sell stock, uh, either in your own company that, uh, or um, stock in another company, all right. So uh, this is a uh, this is a income, right? So when I say sale of stock, it could mean it could mean that you did an IPO, right? Or it could mean you had stock in another company and you brought in cash. All right. And outflows would be just if you notice outflows, they're just the opposite, right? A decrease is an increase, an increase is a decrease, and net losses after taxes. Dividends, of course, are, are going to lower your cash, right? Dividends are going to lower your cash. 
And if you repurchase uh, some of your stock back, you got to pay out cash, right? And it's a nice example here of Apple's cash flows. So this is a nice blurb to read. All right, so again, a decrease in an asset is an inflow of cash because, again, because you sold it, right? Let's make that blue because you sold it, right? It is because cash that has been tied up in the asset is released and can be used for some other purpose, such as repaying a, a loan. In contrast, an increase in the firm's cash balance is an outflow of cash because additional cash is being tied up in the firm's cash balance. So that's important. So if your cash balance, if you're just piling up cash, right, you don't have use of it, it's an outflow. Again, because additional cash is being tied up in your cash balance. And this is an important point, as you can see here. The concept of uh, decreases and increases in cash balance is difficult for many uh, students, right? So let's go through this. Imagine that you store all your cash in a bucket. Your cash balance is represented by the amount of cash in the bucket. When you need cash, you withdraw it from the bucket, which decreases your cash balance and provides an inflow of cash to you, right? Conversely, when you have excess cash, you deposit it in the bucket, which increases your cash balance and represents an outflow of cash from you. Focus on the movement of funds in and out of your pocket, okay? So that's the important point here. A decrease in cash from the bucket is an inflow to your pocket. An increase in cash in the bucket is an outflow. All right, so again now, let's hit depreciation again. Depreciation is an example of a non-cash charge. And that's real, real an important point. We'll make that blue, right? An expense that is deducted on the income statement but does not involve an actual outlay of cash. Therefore, when measuring the amount of cash flow generated by a firm, we have to add depreciation and any other non-cash expenses back to net income. Okay? All right. So, depreciation appears as a source of cash. So, this is, and you'll see that on the cash flow statement later. This is real, real important. Depreciation is a source of cash. So, because depreciation is treated as a separate cash inflow, only changes in gross rather than net fixed assets appears on the statement of cash flows. The change in net fixed assets is equal to the change in gross fixed assets minus the uh, depreciation charge. So, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to double count depreciation. Okay. So, um, I'm going to add a little uh, extra uh, video here. I hope it works on depreciation. And uh, that's going to take us till about a half hour, I guess. And then I'll pick up on the state. We'll start looking at the statement of cash flows again. All right. Here. Here we're just been going over an overview of this maker's tax depreciation system. And this is a requirement here by the Internal Revenue Service of the United States government uh, for corporations when they're depreciating their assets here for tax reporting. Again, what does this maker stand for? Well, that's the uh, stands for the Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System here. So that's the uh, abbreviation here for it. And what corporations normally do is they're using GAAP here for their book depreciation, but for tax reporting and taxes, they have to use this maker system. Okay, so the maker's depreciation tax basis, it has three main elements here. Number one, it has a mandated tax life, generally shorter than the economic 
economic life. So for GAAP, they're using the economic life of the asset, and for makers here, they're using a tax life, and that's a predetermined life here by uh, ca asset category or whatever your asset is. They have a predetermined tax life for it. Number two, uh, the cost recoveries on an accelerated basis. In number three, and assign salvage value of zero to your asset here. You depreciate your asset to a zero value, no salvage value at the end of the maker's life here. So let's just go and look at a typical text uh, table here. And we, we're just, these are the percentages or of depreciation that you're allowed here uh, per year here in this case. So first off, let's just uh, look at it here, uh, identify the elements, and then we'll go and look at the definition of these. So what we would have here, of course, we have our years shown here, and then we have a particular or a specified percentage of depreciation allowed here for each of the, each of those years here by uh, class here and property class. What we're talking about here is, is three, five, seven, and so on here. These are called property classes. And what we mean by that is um, each um, group of assets or the, the government would have, the IRS would have defined here like for a three-year life that might include, and they'd have a listing of uh, assets here that might be tooling or sm uh, l small equipment for the shop or in the office, desks, computers, and so forth. And then as you move down the chart here, um, each of the, it's identified here as a property class here by number of years here and that's the depreciation here years here on those asset classes you might get up to five years here cars or trucks or something like that and then seven years might be other like machinery or equipment or something like that and then okay you've so you've got your property class identified here and then you would have uh, the depreciation method here uh, either we'd have a decline and you it would be declining balance most of the time here there are some options here and then uh, for the method you'd have your particular convention like for example here the declining balance we're looking at on this uh, tax uh, depreciation table here as a percentage a mid-year or a half year you you could also have like a quarter of a year as well. So that would require a, spe a different tax table here. So let's go and look at our definitions here. So uh, again, maker's depreciation, you reference the IRS publications here for determining how you depreciate your asset here for this maker system. So uh, a here, you have these uh, different options here. So for A, that's a den general depreciation system and it's referred to as GDS or you have B here in an alternative depreciation system that would be identified as ADS. And then we have two different methods here. Number one, you have the declining balance. That would be like for your mid-year and your mid-quarter depreciation. And number two here, you have a straight line option. You have an option to go to the straight line and that could be like for the mid-year, mid-quarter, or mid-month. And what do we mean by mid here? Mid means whatever period the asset is placed into service, you use the middle date for that period. So for example, if we're looking for mid-quarter, uh, we'd have to identify which quarter, say it was the fourth quarter, so then we would have October, November, December, yeah. and so when we mean by mid-quarter, we'd be using the middle of the quarter or November 15th as our depreciation date here. And then the other item here, each item of depreciable property belongs to a property class here, a defined life. So uh, what we were talking about before the property class, for example, a car or a truck that's being depreciated, it would go into a particular property class here or have a defined life according to our depreciation chart. And uh, just g looking at uh, our what's tied in here. So this maker property class, we have a, say particular property classes here. And what uh, there, what's tied into this here, the depreciation method depends on the property class. So whatever uh, depreciation method you have depends on the particular property class. And just showing here in general terms here, our uh, say our uh, 3, 5, 7, and 10 year property here, you use a 200% declining balance here according to the IRS uh, depreciation percentages per their charts here. And then for like 15 and 20 year property, you use 150% declining balance. And then the 27 and a half to 39 year uh, property here, uh, classification here, you use a straight line here. And then one last point here, the recovery period for most property generally are longer under the ADS uh, uh, option here than they are under the GDS here. So let's go back to our table tax 
uh, percentage table here. Again, this here, let's just go over it here in a little bit more detail. We would have the property class. Remember, property class is defined uh, by years here, like we got three year, five year, seven, 10, 15, and 20. And then the method here. Well, in this case, we're looking at this table here. It's a declining balance. And then we have the convention here. In this case, it's a mid year or half year convention. So when you're uh, setting up your depreciation here, uh, you have to determine, uh, select the proper table here based on the method here that you'd be using uh, like declining balance here and there are options here for straight line and then the convention well it depends if you're talking about mid-year versus mid-quarter each one of them has its own uh, table here for depreciation okay let's look at it a little closer here so we've got our years here and then for each year we have the percentage of a depreciation allowed here and the point we want to make here is that our, these are our depreciation rates here by year here that are allowed and then uh, we depreciate our asset to a zero value. See these tables are set up such that you take your whatever uh, property class or asset you have it depreciates it down to a zero value. There's no salvage value it just depreciated it totally down to a zero value here and you're going to notice here it does it through what they call a switch over to the straight line depreciation and the tables have built into them those percentages so you can I got them just marked here you'll see a constant percentage like in under the seven year you'll see a eight point nine two five percentage and you'll see them in three years in a row well that's uh, based on this switch over to straight line such that you depreciate your asset down to a zero amount and so all you have to do is pick out your uh, define what you what whatever asset you have define the property class here make sure you got the proper meth uh, table uh, method here for the table for the property method that you were using and then the proper convention be it a mid-year or a mid-quarter so forth then um, okay we went over this switch over to straight line depreciation so if you see these in the table that constant percentage for a number of years in a row you know why because you're switching over here such that you get a zero uh, depreciate or a zero asset value at the end here of the s are at the end of the property class or the assets life here and then again remember these tables here you have to reference them to a uh, uh, the IRS here these tables are published they're published all over yeah, on the internet and so forth uh, go and you reference the table here and make sure you get the proper method here and for the proper convention here and then you pick out your property class here based on the method here in the convention and then one other thing here when uh, to make it a little easier here when you're using or trying to calculate your uh, 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 tax depreciation on a per asset. Uh, just go to the internet and find uh, there's many Excel available online uh, depreciation schedules or calculates out your depreciation here and lists it. So what you would be looking at here using this Excel method or whatever method you're going to be using you would have your asset class you have to determine what class of assets you have here and that ties into the the recovery period here defies defined is defined here by this asset class here and then you again you work your depreciation basis here plug that in here and then you have to determine your depreciation method be it declining balance or straight line and then the convention again here uh, for straight line there's some more allowances here like you'd have mid-year mid-quarter or mid month here and then in the case here where you have like the mid quarter here you had placed into service then you de define what quarter that you're putting it into first second third or fourth here and then one other thing here you have your declining balance factor here uh, in case you know 200 percent versus 150 percent so again make good use of the, any of uh, these Excel tables that are available online here for calculating out your depreciation here or to cross check what you're doing here and then one other thing here uh, go bank going back to the table here again remember that's issued here by the Internal Revenue Service and that's uh, you would use these here uh, again depending on what asset that you would be depreciating and again for tax purposes here these are specifically um, for your tax accounting here and your book accounting or your gap 
uh, you would just go back and use your regular methods. But for tax purposes, you have to use one of these uh, modified accelerated cost recovery system tables here.